The Story of Connor Old House by Kay and Hesketh Pritchard I hold, Mr. Flaxman Law was saying, that there are no other laws in what we term the realm of the supernatural but those which are the projections or extensions of natural laws. Very likely that's so, returned Naribs with suspicious humility. But all the same, Connor Old House presents problems that won't work in with any natural laws I'm acquainted with. I almost hesitate to give voice to them. They sound so impossible and... and absurd. Let's judge of them, said Lowe. It is said, said Naribs, standing up with his back to the fire, it is said that a shining man haunts the place. Also, a light is frequently seen in the library. I've watched it myself of a night from here. Yet the dust there, which happens to lie very thick over the floor and the furniture, has afterwards shown no sign of disturbance. Have you satisfactory evidence of the presence of the shining man? I think so, replied Naribs shortly. I saw him myself the night before I wrote asking you to come up to see me. I went into the house after dusk and was on the stairs when I saw him. The tall figure of a man, absolutely white and shining. His back was towards me, but the sullen, raised shoulders and sidelong head expressed a degree of sinister animosity that exceeded anything I've ever met with. So I left him in possession, for it's a fact that anyone who has tried to leave his card at Connor Old House has left his wits with it. It certainly sounds rather absurd, said Mr. Lowe, but I suppose we have not heard all about it yet? No, there is a tragedy connected with the house, but it's quite a commonplace sort of story, and in no way accounts for the Shining Man. Naribs was a young man of means, who spent most of his time abroad, but the above conversation took place at the spot to which he always referred as home, a shooting lodge connected with his big grouse moor on the west coast of Scotland. The lodge was a small new house, built in a damp valley, with a trout stream running just beyond the garden hedge. From the high ground above, where the moor stretched out towards the Solway Firth, it was possible on a fine day to see the dark cone of Elsa Craig rising above the shimmering ripples. But Mr. Lowe happened to arrive in a spell of bad weather, when nothing was visible about the lodge but a few roots of sodden lowland and a curve of the yellow tumbling little river, and beyond a murky outline of shouldering hills blurred by the ever-falling rain. It may have been eleven o'clock on a depressing muggy night, when Naribs began to talk about Connor Old House, as he sat with his guests over a crackling flaming fire of pine wood. Connor Old House stands on a spur of the ridge opposite, one of the finest sights possible, and it belongs to me. Yet I am obliged to live in this damp little bog hole, for the man who would pass a night in Connor is not to be met with in this country. Sullivan, the third man present, replied he was. Perhaps, with a glance at Lowe, there were two, which stank Naribs, who turned his words into a deliberate challenge. "'Is it a bet?' asked Sullivan, rising. He was a tallish man, dark and clean-shaven, whose features were well known to the public in connection with the emerald green jersey of the rugby international football team of Ireland. "'If it is, it's a bet I'm going to win. Good night.' In the morning, Naribs, I'll trouble you for the difference. The affair is much more in Lowe's line than in yours, said Naribs. But you're not really going. You may take it I am, though. Don't be a fool, Jack. Lowe, tell him not to go. Tell him there are things no man ought to meddle with, he broke off. There are things no man can meddle with, replied Sullivan, obstinately fixing his cap on his head. And my backing out of this bet would stand in as one of them. Naribs was strangely urgent. Lo, speak to him, you know. Flaxman Lo saw that this big Irishman's one vanity had got upon its legs. He also saw that Naribs was very much in earnest. Sullivan's big enough to take care of himself, he said, laughing. 
At the same time, if he doesn't object, we might as well hear the story before he starts. Sullivan hesitated, then flung his cap into a corner. That's so, he said. It was a warm night for the time of the year, and they could hear, through the open window, the splashing downpour of the rain. There is nothing so lonely as the drip of heavy rain, began Naribs. I always associated it with Conorold House. The place has stood empty for ten years or more, and this is the story they tell about it. It was last inhabited by a Sir James Mackian, who had been a merchant of sorts in Sierra Leone. When the baronetcy fell into him, he came to England and settled down in this place with a pretty daughter and a lot of servants, including a nigger named Jake, whose life he was said to have saved in Africa. Everything went on well for nearly two years, when Sir James had occasion to go to Edinburgh for a few days. During his absence, his daughter was found dead in her bed, having taken an overdose of some sleeping draught. The shock proved too great for her father. He tried travelling, but on his return home he fell into a settled melancholy and died some months later, a damn imbecile at the asylum. "'Well, I shan't object to meeting the girl, as she's so pretty.' remarked Sullivan, with a laugh. But there's not much in the story. Of course, added Naribs, countryside gossip adds a good deal of colour to the plain facts of the case. It is said that terrible details connected with Miss Mackian's death were suppressed at the inquest, and people recollected afterwards that for months the girl had worn an unhappy, frightened look. It seemed she disliked the negro and had been heard to beg her father to send him away, but the old man would not listen to any suggestion of the kind. "'What became of the negro in the end?' asked Flaxman Low. "'In the end Sir James kicked him out after a violent scene, in the course of which he appears to have accused Jake of having caused the girl's death. The nigger swore he'd be revenged on him, but as a matter of fact, he left the place almost immediately and has never been heard of since, which disposes of the nigger. A short time after the old man went mad, he was found lying on a couch in the library, a hopeless imbecile. Saying this, Naribs went to the window and looked out into the rainy darkness. Connor Old House stands on the ridge opposite, and a part of this building, including the library window, where the light is sometimes seen, is visible through the trees from here. There is no light there tonight, though. Sullivan laughed his big, full laugh. How about your shining man? I hope we may have the luck to meet. I suspect some canny Scots tramp knows where to get a snug roost rent free. That may be so, replied Naribs with a slow patience. I can only say that after seeing the light of a night, I have more than once gone up in the morning to have a look at the library and never found the thick dust in the least disturbed. Have you noticed if the light appears at regular intervals? said Low. No, it's there on and off. I generally see it in rainy weather. What sort of people have gone crazy in Conorold House? asked Sullivan. One was a tramp. He must have lived pleasantly in the kitchens for days. Then he took to the library, which didn't agree with him, apparently. He was found in a dying state, lying upon Sir James's couch, with horrible black patches on his face. He was too far gone to speak, so nothing was gleaned from him. He probably had a dirty face to start with, and having caught cold in the rain, went into Connor Old House and died quietly there of pneumonia or something of the kind, just as you or I might have done, tucked up in our own little beds at home commented Sullivan. The last man to try his luck with the ghosts, went on Naribs, without noticing the remark, was a young fellow called Bowie, a nephew of Sir James. He was a student at Edinburgh University, and he wanted to clear up the mystery. I was not at home, but my factor allowed him to pass a night in the house. As he did not appear next day, they went to look for him. He was found lying on the couch, and he has not spoken a rational word since. Sheer, mere physical fright acting on an overwrought brain, Sullivan summed up the case scornfully. And now I'm off. The rain has stopped and I'll get up to the house before midnight. You may expect me at dawn to tell you what I've seen. What do you intend to do when you get there? asked Flaxman Low. 
I'll pass the night on the ghostly couch, which I suppose I shall find in the library. Take my word for it. Madness is in Sir James's family. Father and daughter and nephew all gave proof of it in different ways. The tramp, who was perhaps in there for a couple of days, died a natural death. It only needs a healthy man to run the gauntlet and set all this foolish talk at rest. Narives was plainly much disturbed, though he made no further objection. But when Sullivan was gone, he moved restlessly about the room, looking out of the window from time to time. Suddenly he spoke. There it is, the light I mentioned to you. Mr. Lowe went to the window. Away on the opposite ridge, a faint light glimmered out through the thick gloom. Then he glanced at his watch. Rather over an hour since you started, he remarked. Well now, Naribs, if you will be so good as to hand me human origins from the shelf behind you, I think we may settle down to wait for dawn. Sullivan's just the man to give a good account of himself, under most circumstances. Heaven sent there may be no black side to this business, said Naribs. Of course I was a fool to say what I did about the old house, but nobody except an ass like Jack would think I meant it. I wish the night was well over. That light is due to go out in two hours anyway. Even to Mr. Lowe, the night seemed unbearably long, but at the first streak of dawn he tossed his book on to the sofa, stretched himself and said, We may as well be moving. Let's go and see what Sullivan is doing. The rain had begun to fall again and was coming down in close straight lines as the two men drove up the avenue to Connor Old House. As they ascended, the trees grew thicker on the banks of the cutting, which led them in curves to the terrace on which stood the house. Although it was a modern red brick building, rather picturesque with gables and sharply pitched overhanging roofs, it looked desolate and forbidding enough in the grey daybreak. To the left lay lawns and gardens, to the right the cliff fell away steeply to where the burn roared in spades some three hundred feet below. They drove round to the empty stables, and then hurried back to the house on foot by a path that debouched directly in front of the library window. Naribs stopped under it and shouted, Hello! Jack, where are you? But no answer came, and they went on to the hall door. The gloom of the wet dawning and the heavy smell of stagnant air filled the big hall as they looked round at its dreary emptiness. The silence within the house itself was oppressive. Again Naribs shouted, and the noise echoed harshly through the passages, jarring on the stillness. Then he led the way to the library at a run. As they came in sight of the doorway, a wave of some nauseating odor met them, and at the same moment they saw Sullivan lying just outside the threshold, his body twisted and rigid like a man in the extremity of pain, his contorted profile ivory pale against the dark oak flooring. As they stooped to raise him, Mr. Law had just time to notice the big gloomy room beyond, with its heaped and trembled layers of accumulated dust. There was no time for more than a glance, for the indescribable fetid odor almost overpowered them as they hastened to carry Sullivan into the open air. "'We must get him home as soon as we can,' said Mr. Law, "'for we have a very sick man on our hands.' These proved to be true. But in a few days, thanks to Mr. Lowe's treatment and untiring care, the severe physical symptoms became less urgent and in due time Sullivan's mind cleared. The following account is taken from the written statement of his experience in Connor Old House. On reaching the house, he entered as noiselessly as possible and made for the library, finding his way by the help of a series of matches to Sir James's couch, upon which he lay down. He was conscious at once of an acrid taste in his mouth, which he accounted for by the clouds of dust he had raised in crossing the room. First he began to think about the approaching football match with Scotland for which he was already in training. He was still in his mood of derisive incredulity. The house seemed vastly empty and wrapped in an uneasy silence, a silence which made each of his comfortable movements an omen of significance. Presently the sense of a presence in the room was borne in upon him. He sat up and spoke softly. He almost expected someone to answer him, and so strong did this feeling become that he called out, Who's there? 
No reply came, and he sat on amidst the oppressive silence. He says the slightest noise would have been a relief. It was the listening in the silence that bred in him so intense a longing to grapple with some solid opponent. Fear, he who had denied the very existence of cause for fear, found himself shivering with an untranslatable terror. This was fear. He realized it with an infinite recoil of anger. Presently he became aware that the darkness about him was clearing. A feeble light filtered slowly through it from above. Looking up at the ceiling, he perceived directly above his head an irregular patch of pale phosphorescent luminance, which grew gradually brighter. How long he sat with his head thrown back, staring at the light, he does not know. It seemed years. Then he spoke to himself plainly. With an immense effort he forced his eyes away from the light and got upon his feet to drag his limbs around the room. The phosphorescence was of a greenish tint and as strong as moonlight, but the dust rose like vapor at the slightest movement and somewhat obscured its power. He moved about, but not for long. A clogging weight, such as one feels in nightmare, pressed upon him, and his exhaustion was intensified by the overpowering physical disgust bred in him by the repulsive odor which passed across his face as he staggered back to the couch. For a few moments he would not look up. He says he had an impression that someone was watching him through the radiance as through a window. The atmosphere about him was thickening and cloaking the walls with drowsy horror, while his senses revolted and choked at the growing odor. Then followed a state of semi-sleep, for he recollects no more until he found himself staring again at the luminous patch on the ceiling. By this time the brightness was beginning to dim, dark smears showed through it here and there, which ran slowly together till out of them grew and protruded a fat, black, evil face. A second later, Sullivan was aware that the horrible face was sinking down nearer and nearer to his own, while all about it the light changed to black, dripping fluid that formed great drops and fell. It seemed as if he could not save himself, he could not move. The fighting blood in him had died out. Then fear, mad fear and strong loathing gave him the strength to act. He saw his own hand working savagely, it passed through and through the impending face, yet he swears that he felt a slight impact and that he saw the fat glazed skin quiver. Then with a final struggle he tore himself from the couch and rushing to the door he wrenched it open and plunged forward into a red vacancy, down, down. After that he remembers no more. While Sullivan still lay ill and unable to give an account of himself or of what had happened at Conorold House, Mr. Flaxman Law expressed his intention of paying a visit to the asylum for the purpose of seeing young Bowie. But on arriving at the asylum, he found that Bowie had died during the previous night. A weary-eyed assistant doctor took Mr. Law to see the body. Bowie had evidently been of a gaunt but powerful build. The features, though harsh, were noble, the face being somewhat disfigured by a rough, raised discoloration which extended from the centre of the forehead to behind the right ear. Mr. Lowe asked a question. Yes, a very obscure case, observed the young doctor, but it is the disease he died of. When he was brought here some months ago, he had a small dark spot on his forehead but it spread rapidly, and there are now similar large patches over the whole of his body. I take it to be of a cancerous character, likely to occur in a scruffless subject after a shock and severe mental strain, such as Bowie chose to subject himself to by passing a night in Conorold House. The first result of the shock was imbecility. An increasingly lethargic condition of the body supervened, and finally coma. While the doctor was speaking, Mr. Lowe bent over the dead man and closely examined the mark upon the face. This mark appears to be the result of a fungoid growth, perhaps akin to the Indian disease known as mesotoma, he said at length. It may be so. The case is very obscure, but the disease, whatever we may call it, appears to be in Bowie's family, 
for I believe his uncle, Sir James Mackeon, had precisely similar symptoms during his last illness. He also died in this institution, but that was before my time, replied the assistant. After a further examination of the body, Mr. Lowe took his leave, and during the following day or two was busily engaged in a spare empty room placed at his disposal by Narib's. A deal table and chair were all he required, Mr. Lowe explained, and to these he added a microscope, an apparatus for producing a moist heat, and the coat worn by Sullivan on the night of his adventure. At the end of the third day, as Sullivan was already on the road to recovery, Mr. Lowe, accompanied by Naribs, paid a second visit to Conrold House, during which Lowe mentioned some of his conclusions about the strange events which had occurred there. It will be an easy task to compare Mr. Flaxman Lowe's theory with the experience detailed by Sullivan, and with the one or two subsequent discoveries that added something like confirmation to his conclusions. Mr. Lowe and his host drove up as on the previous occasion and stabled the horse as before. The day was dry but grey, and the time the early afternoon. As they ascended the path leading to the house, Mr. Lowe remarked, after gazing up for a few seconds at the library window, "'The room has the air of being occupied.' "'Why, what makes you think so?' asked Naribs nervously. "'It is hard to say, but it produces that impression.' Naribs shook his head despondently. "'I have always noticed it myself,' he returned. "'I wish Sullivan were all right again and able to tell us what he saw in there. Whatever it was, it has nearly cost him his life. I don't suppose we shall ever know anything more definite about the matter.' "'I fancy I can tell you,' replied Low. "'But let us get on into the library and see what it looks like before we enter into the subject any further. By the way, I should advise you to tie your handkerchief over your mouth and nose before we go into the room. Naribs, upon whom the events of the last few days had had a very strong effect, was in a state of scarcely controllable excitement. What do you mean, Lo? You can't have any idea. Yes, I believe the dust in the house to be simply poisonous. Sullivan inhaled any amount of it, hence his condition. The same suggestion of loneliness and stagnation hung about the house as they passed through the hall and entered the library. They halted at the door and looked in. The amount of greenish dust in the room was extraordinary. It lay in little drifts and mounds over the floor, but most abundantly just about the couch. Immediately above this spot they perceived on the ceiling a long, discoloured stain. Naribs pointed to it. Do you see that? It is a blood stain, and, I give you my word, it grows larger and larger every year. He finished the sentence in a low voice and shuddered. Ah, so I should have expected, observed Flaxman Lowe, who was looking at the stained ceiling with much interest. That, of course, explains everything. Lowe, tell me what you mean. A blood stain that grows year by year explains everything? Naribs broke off and pointed to the couch. Look there! A cat's been walking over the sofa. Mr. Lowe put his hand on his friend's shoulder and smiled. My dear fellow, that stain on the ceiling is simply a patch of mold and fungi. Now come in carefully, without raising the dust, and let us examine the cat's footsteps, as you call them. Naribs advanced to the couch and considered the marks gravely. They are not the footmarks of any animal. They are something much more unaccountable. They are raindrops. And why should raindrops be here in this perfectly watertight room, and even then only in one small part of it? You can't very well explain that, and you certainly can't have expected it. Look around and follow my points, replied Mr. Lowe. When we came to fetch Sullivan, I noticed the dust which far exceeds the ordinary accumulation, even in the most neglected places. You may also notice that it is of a greenish color and of extreme fineness. This dust is of the same nature as the powder you find in a poofball, and is composed of minute sporoloid bodies. I found that Sullivan's coat was covered with this fine dust, and also about the collar and upper portion of the sleeve I found one or two gummy drops which correspond to these raindrops as you call them. I naturally concluded from their position that they had fallen from above. 
from the dust or rather spores which I found on Sullivan's coat, I have since cultivated no fewer than four specimens of fungi, of which three belong to known African species. But the fourth, so far as I know, has never been described. But it approximates most closely to one of the Phaleodae. But how about the raindrops, or whatever they are? I believe they drop from that horrible stain. They are drops from the stain, and are caused by the unnamed fungus I have just alluded to. It matures very rapidly, and absolutely decays as it matures, liquefying into a sort of dark mucilage, full of spores, which drips down and diffuses a most repulsive odor. In time the mucilage dries, leaving the dust of the spores. I don't know much about these things myself, replied Naribs dubiously, and it strikes me you know more than enough. But look here, how about the light? You saw it last night yourself. It happens that the three species of African fungi possess well-known phosphorescent properties, which are manifested not only during decomposition, but also during the period of growth. The light is only visible from time to time. Probably climatic and atmospheric conditions only admit of occasional efflorescence. But, objected Naribs, supposing it to be a case of poisoning by fungi, as you say, how is it that Sullivan, though exposed to precisely the same sources of danger as the others who have passed a night here, has escaped? He has been very ill, but his mind has already regained its balance whereas in the three other cases the mind was wholly destroyed. Mr. Lowe looked very grave. My dear fellow, you are such an excitable and superstitious person that I hesitate to put your nerves to any further test. Oh, go on. I hesitate for two reasons. The one I have mentioned, and also because in my answer I must speak of curious and unpleasant things, some of which are proved facts, others only more or less well-founded assumptions. It is acknowledged that fungi exert an important influence in certain diseases, a few being directly attributable to fungi as a primary cause. Also, it is an historical fact that poisonous fungi have more than once been used to alter the fate of nations. From the evidence before us, and the condition of Bowie's body, I can but conclude that the unknown fungus I have alluded to is of a singularly malignant nature, and acts through the skin upon the brain with terrible rapidity, afterwards gradually interpenetrating all the tissues of the body and eventually causing death. In Sullivan's case, luckily, the falling drops only touched his clothing, not his skin. But wait a minute, Lo. How did these fungi come here? And how can we read the house of them? I pawn my word, it is enough to make a man go off his head to hear about it. What are you going to do now? In the first place, we will go upstairs and examine the flooring just above that stained patch of ceiling. You can't do that, I'm afraid. The room above this happens to be divided into two portions by a hollow partition between two feet and three feet thick, said Naribs, the interior of which may originally have been meant for a cupboard, but I don't think it has ever been used. Then let us examine the cupboard. There must be some way of getting into it. Upon this, Naribs led the way upstairs, but as he gained the top, he leaned back, and grasping Mr. Lowe by the arm, thrust him violently forward. Look, the light! Did you see the light? he said. For a second or two, it seemed as if a light, like the elusive light thrown by a rotating reflector, quivered on the four walls of the landing, then disappeared almost before one could be certain of having seen it. Can you point me out the precise spot where you saw the shining figure you told us of? asked Low. Naribs pointed to a dark corner of the landing. Just there, in front of that panel between the two doors. Now that I come to think of it, I fancy there is some means of opening the upper part of that panel. The idea was to ventilate the cupboard-like space I mentioned just now. Naribs walked across the landing and felt around the panel till he found a small metal knob. On turning this, the upper part of the panel fell back like a shutter, disclosing a narrow space of darkness beyond. Naribs thrust his head into the opening and peered into the gloom, but immediately started back with a gasp. The shining man, he cried, he's there! Mr. Flaxman Lowe, hardly knowing what to expect, looked over his shoulder, then, exerting his strength, pulled away some of the lower boarding. 
for within, at arm's length, stood a dimly shining figure, a tall man with his back towards them, leaning against the left side of the partition, and shrouded from head to foot in faintly luminous white mould. The figure remained quite motionless while they stared at it in surprise. Then Mr. Flaxman Low pulled on his glove, and, leaning forward, touched the man's head. A portion of the white mass came away in his fingers, the lower surface of which showed a bunch of frizzled negroid hair. "'Good heavens, Lo, what do you make of this?' asked Naribs. "'It must be the body of Jake. But what is this shining stuff?' Lo stood under the white skylight and examined what he held in his fingers. "'Fungus,' he said at last and it appears to have some property allied to the mouldy fungus which attacks the common house fly. Have you not seen them dead upon window panes, stiffly fixed upon their legs and covered with a white mould? Something of the same kind has taken place here. But what had Jake to do with the fungus? And how did he come here? All that, of course, we can only surmise, replied Mr. Lowe. There is little doubt that secrets of nature hidden from us are well known to the various African tribes. It is possible that the Negro possessed some of these deadly spores, but how or why he made use of them are questions that can never be cleared up now. But what was he doing here? asked Naribs. As I said before, we can only guess the answer to that question, but I should suppose that the Negro made use of this cupboard as a place where he could be free from interruption that he here cultivated the spores is proved by the condition of his body and of the ceiling immediately below. Such an occupation is by no means free from danger, especially in an airless and enclosed space like this. It is evident that either by design or accident he became infected by the fungus poison, which in time covered his whole body as you now see. The subject of Obia, Flaxman Lowe went on reflectively, is one to the study of which I intend to devote myself at some future period. I have indeed already made some arrangements for an expedition in connection with the subject into the interior of Africa. And how is the horrible thing to be got rid of? Nothing short of burning the place down would be of any radical use, remarked Naribs. Lo, who by this time was deeply engrossed in considering the strange facts with which he had just become acquainted, answered abstractedly, I suppose not. Narib said no more, and the words were only recalled to Mr. Lowe's mind a day or two later, when he received by post a copy of the West Coast Advertiser. It was addressed in the handwriting of Narib's, and the following extract was lightly scored. Connor Old House, the property of Thomas Narib's, Esquire of Connor Lodge, was, we regret to say, destroyed by fire last night. We are sorry to add that the loss to the owner will be considerable, as no insurance policy had been affected with regard to the property. End of the story of Connor Old House.